Hi everyone, it's MJ and welcome to the third episode of the Actuarial Podcast. Yeah! Woo! As you can hear, I have got some guests for this one as we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship and startups in Cape Town. So I thought, let me invite the guys from Radcast who are doing something pretty, pretty epic. Um, so yeah, for this podcast, we're going to just talk about entrepreneurship in general, like what's the whole startup scene in Cape Town. And then the second part, we're going to yeah, learn a little bit more about Radcast and what they're doing. But uh, let's let's find out a little bit more about the two people we have uh, with me today. So Dom, Josh, I don't know who wants to start. Give a little a little intro, like you know where you where you from, what you studied. I don't know something interesting about yourself. So Josh's story is more interesting than mine. So I'll go nice. first. <laughs> um, I studied accounting, finance, and soul destruction at Ooh, accounting. UCT. Ooh. Yeah, it was a very bad decision. <laughs> Terrible life decision, that. I wrote my board exam in January and then decided not to do my articles. I had a job at Deloitte London. That's I a smart choice. Out. Smart choice, smart man. Yeah, yeah. I pulled out um, because we got funding for our uh, company from Alan Gray's VC arm, which is called E Squared. Okay. And we've been doing that for the last two years. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Cool. Uh, what's up, everyone? My name's Josh. Uh, I actually, not many people know this, but I also started studying accounting. Ooh. I was a little bit of a quicker <laughs> learner than Dom, and I quit after six months. Um, changed to mechatronic engineering, which I absolutely loved. Dabbled in a bit of bio and spy robotics for my kind of specialization. Worked in cancer diagnostic research for a while. Uh, and then Dom pretty much convinced me after hours to leave uh, my job in medical tech and join him in the startup world. So my parents were thrilled, um, but it's been one of the best decisions ever, and we've had an incredible roller coaster journey. So yeah, okay. Josh is being really modest. He he was top of his class in engineering. Plus he's got a brain tumor, so he's living with cancer, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, tomorrow is six years since he was diagnosed. Oh jeez. And yeah. they to they told him he had three years to live. So it's pretty cool that he's still here. Yeah, we haven't got 2x ROI on our VC fund yet, but mm -hmm. I've got 2x ROI on my life expectancy so far. So, no, that's good, yeah. that's good. And he still yeah. manages to keep his sense of tumor. So it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I just to clarify a fact, I, I'm not living with cancer anymore. It was act, my, I had a brain tumor that was acting malignantly in 2012, and I was given three years to live in October 2012, and... From then, this is a story for a whole nother podcast, possibly. But um, yeah, I'm all good now, kind of in remission, and it, it's acting benignly now, so all good. Life okay. expectancy pushed out significantly. And this is relevant to actual scientists. Well, yeah, I mean... Yeah, so I mean, well, you tell me. If well, well, well this, is, this is the interesting <laughs> thing with, with actual science, is the one stats like, around cancer that people like to say is like, oh, look, so many more people are, are getting cancer. You know, and they say, oh, it's because of cell phones, technology, and all of these things. And that's the one theory that people put forward. But as actuaries, we're always told to question the data and say, well, hold on, maybe more people are getting cancer because technology has improved in picking it up. So before, oh. you know, people were, might have been dying and we didn't know that it was cancer. But now because we have better understanding, oh. we're picking it up. So it, it's one of these things where we've got to be very careful where just because we see an increase in a trend, it might not necessarily be because that thing is increasing. It's just because we're becoming better at picking the whole thing up. It's the same with negative news. These so, days. yeah, if you look for it, you're going to find, find a little bit more of it. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you guys a question just to like, yeah. Kick, cool. Kickstarter, and seeing that you both have a little bit of an accounting background, <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting I'm expecting a good answer. I'm actually going to be very disappointed if you guys don't, guys don't get this one. So no pressure. But in your own words or in your own mind, what do you think an actuary does? Firstly, I love it when people say "in your own words" because okay. <laughs> I'm sort of using the words that everyone else is using. Fair enough. But you do Fair you enough. do have a computer with you, so I don't want you like to quickly Google the actuarial definition and be like, oh, an yeah. actuary is someone. Don likes to take adages literally. Okay. <laughs> so an actuarial scientist is someone who goes to varsity to tell everyone that they're doing act actuarial science, and then in the second year they do something else. Okay. Okay. That's quite a. That's like a very broad. I mean, that's the popular opinion because that's what a lot of people yeah, call it. Yeah. I was gonna say it's it's gonna be tough to factually top that. Um, I'll I'll try to be a little bit more serious and say that an actuary is someone who builds mathematical models to predict future outcomes in various industries for financial applications, okay. mostly. 
Okay, that, yeah, Josh Josh wins that round. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> well, he wins not only on the definition, but also because yeah, the term is actually not actuarial scientist. Okay. Although, although you see like all the kids graduating nowadays and they say, oh, I'm now an actuarial scientist. So mm. maybe the millennials are going to change <laughs> just by, you know, by sheer, sheer numbers change that. But um, it's, it's weird because, I mean, I thought actuarial science was all about mathematics. That was, I did well in maths. People said, come do actuarial science. But it's more of a business degree than anything else. And, I mean, we look into marketing. We did a whole, well, the whole podcast last week was on ethics. You know, we do more than just numbers you know a mathematician or a statistician would just be focused with okay how do i make the numbers work how do i make this theory and this proof and make everything look good and actually has got some practical applications you know how can we use these numbers to either improve a business make life better for for other people so one one thing that actuaries i wish would get more involved in is you know entrepreneurships and startups and all that type of stuff there is actually an actuary involved in the space. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a guy called Roloff Bertha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Elon, so, Elon's mate. So yeah, So and he, he studied actuarial science at, at UCT. Oh. And I mean, now he's got one of the biggest like funds he's in Sequoia. Sequoia yeah. 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 And um, yeah, I think they've got like a little bit of a stake in Instagram and what's that app that designs games? Unity, I think it's called. Yeah, they're huge. They've got Sequoia Jorba, is invested yeah. in the top companies in the world. Isn't that the biggest? Yeah, in Sequoia is like yeah. regarded as the best VC fund on earth. And and that's because they have a, an actuary. <laughs> <and they've laughs> is that yeah. why? Well, well think, think about it because you've got all these startups. I mean, what a big thing to startups is risk. Yes. And and that's one thing that actuaries like to pride themselves on. We're like a little bit obsessed with risk. We're obsessed with risk because risk contains randomness and that gets us excited, but risk also has consequences. So it's not just a variability for the sake of it, there's actual consequence. And we find that we can use ways to mitigate that risk and you know get rid of it. So that's why even like we've got Hurricane Michael, you know, causing terror, and I'm just thinking, oh, you know, catastrophe models, you know, how would you like base the prices? Because and it's 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 an interesting field that actuaries can also go into is you know weather forecasting and all that. Hmm. But um, but yeah, this this podcast is about entrepreneurship, and I mean, you guys have heard of Discovery here in South Africa. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Again, that was uh, an actuary who had a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, and yeah, I think Discovery is the biggest medical aid in South Africa. Was mm-hmm. like the most well-known one and they're even now branching yeah. out and you see them sponsoring like i think the premier league we saw vitality on one of the games so i was like hey that's like a discovery little discovery offshoot but um tell me with your guys business when you guys started out did you have any risk management strategies or were you just like this is our idea we're gonna go with it um or did you say these are the five things that can absolutely ruin us like did you have any of that discussion or was it just like how are we going to make this thing work i think we sort of um abide by the advice that paul graham gives he's the founder of yc the biggest accelerator in the world Mm -hmm. um or most successful and he just says the only thing you should be focusing on is product market fit and growth um so we just as an indicator of product market fit in the early stage um, so you shouldn't be worrying about absolutely anything other than making something that people want and something that people love. So I guess we did consider the risks and, and what could go wrong, but mm-hmm. we were more just focused on can we make something that people want. Okay. Well, I think that is in, a, in and of itself, if you think from first principles, the ultimate risk mitigation strategy because the ultimate risk of a business is that you design a product that no one wants. Mm-hmm. So you're answering risk number one instead of downstream of that saying, okay, what is the risk of a competitor moving into the space? It's a bit silly if the space is not someone anyone should be in, right? So that's kind of root one, is what, what Dom's talking about, is uh, obsessing about product and how it interacts with your potential customers and seeing if there's really something there. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that's that been our approach and our, our philosophy that we agree with. And then th- there's this other stat, um, and like I say, all stats you have to take with a pinch of salt because you don't know how, how true they are. But there's that stat that says, you know, eight out of 10 startups fail or something mm. like that. And I remember when, when I started like getting into entrepreneurial stuff, I was like, oh, pff, that doesn't apply to me, you know. <laughs> and uh, I started this website back at university called Drop and Shop. It was like reverse auction meets take a lot. And it, it failed after four months. And then my next business failed. Then I made a couple of apps and they all failed, 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 failed. I think 
out of the eight I've started, all eight have failed. But oh. which, means, which means the next two. The next two are going to be big ones. It's going to be huge, folks. It's going to be huge. But but tell me, how how did you guys, were you aware of that? Because I'm sure when you know when you tell people I'm going into the start of space, mm. um, your, your close friends, because other people would just be like, oh, good luck. But your close friends are like, guys, hold on. Do you know what you're getting yourself into? Are you prepared that failure is such a high likelihood? Um, did you guys have those conversations? And were you like, it's different for me because we've got this better? Or what was the thought process behind behind knowing that truth coming into the startup space? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, MJ. And I definitely will admit, I, I think we had a bit of um, naive confidence that mm-hmm. we were young, talented guys and we were going to work hard and have great attitudes. So, uh, yeah, we, we I think we thought we had a fair chance at success. But, um, yeah, no, I, we were at the same time very cognizant that this might fail. And I think going in, um, our decision to do a startup was fundamentally predicated on uh, a life position Dom holds that he's converted me over to, which I think is really cool, is that when you lie on your deathbed uh, 100 years down the line or whatever it is for us these days, do you not want to look back and know that you took some risks mm-hmm. and how that added to the interesting story that is your life? And for us, that meant that doing a startup and entering this ecosystem was the right thing to do, um, even in complete failure, because it does give you a really cool story to tell. And even at this juncture, we haven't succeeded yet, but we have some really cool stories to tell. And compare that to our friends who are doing the articles, no disrespect to them. Um, it, it can, yeah, it, it has a bit more flavor. And then, uh, yeah, on, on the whole notion of uh, eight in every 10 fail, this is just my opinion and I'll, I'll add to what you're saying, is that I think um, startup success is a probability distribution. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the longer you are able to stay in the game, the higher your cumulative probability of success will be. So if you commit like 20 years to being an entrepreneur, I think you're, you're giving yourself a fair shot at succeeding in that space. And over time, your probability of succeeding in subsequent attempts will increase because of your cumulative learning. So the exact nature of your personal probability distribution will be uh, contingent on a number of factors. Um, intelligence, how hard you work, how much sacrifice you want to take, all those different factors. So timing, luck. Timing, all of those things. Mm-hmm. But the longer you can stay in the game, you, you only increase your chances. So yeah, for anyone who's thinking about getting into entrepreneurship, it's definitely something to take into, take to heart. And I think one of the mistakes we made and we've learned over time is that we originally said we're going to commit one year to our first business Mm -hmm. and we've got nothing to lose if we lose one year so what if it goes huge great we've succeeded and it's just not the case if you want to have a dip at entrepreneurship you need to give yourself a fair chance yeah like yes things like instagram blew up after three months but they are the one in a billion like most businesses are going to take three to five years well, 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 that's the thing. I think there's there's this optimistic bias that we have in our society where from an early age we were told all these childhood nursery rhymes, Disney stories, where there's always the happily ever after. Mm. And news likes to focus on the success of entrepreneurs. You know, that like the you'll overnight ne- success. Yeah, you'll never turn on to BBC News and be like, oh, you know, MJ's app on Hypecoin failed, you know, terribly today. <laughs> you know, they because they, they, it's not a big story, it was small, no one really cares. It's only when something big like Instagram, Snapchat, and all these things blow up, that they get a new story. And then we all start thinking, wow, you start an app and it's super successful. Mm. Or in like my case, you get a lot of arrogance from studying actuarial science and you think, oh, I'm smarter than everybody else. Mm. You know, that eight out of 10 doesn't apply to me. Mm. But then when you keep failing, you start also realizing, hold on, I'm failing a lot. And I'm quite, you know, open sometimes, okay, I failed this, failed that. But a lot of people don't like to promote their failures. So we've got the people who are winning getting like a magnifying glass and the people who are failing like hiding it and there is this incredible distortion Mm. which is depressing because I like being an an entrepreneur Um, but it was so depressing that that stat was I actually did go and work for a bit went for 14 months and it makes me think of what you say the stories I mean of those 14 months there building back-end systems for insurance companies I don't really have any cool stories it's not like (laughs) yo guys you know I made this funeral product and it had like a benefit you know, that <laughs> yeah. paid out one month after the funeral. Yeah, yeah, cool story. But, you know, when I talk about my apps and the one where I got sued and there was like <laughs> a court case looming and, you know, the sleepless nights. Way you know, more interesting. Yeah, it, it's a lot more of an interesting story 
than than that. So I've I'm like yeah on your guy's side in the sense that I've said I don't want to do the corporate world. I want to do the entrepreneur thing. I like being the master of my own fate. Um, I did read somewhere, and I think you guys can comment on this, that when you work for yourself, you work much longer, you earn way less, <laughs> but you are much happier. Would you guys agree with those three statements? That you're working longer, you're earning less, but you're happier. <laughs> well, I've never worked in corporate, so I don't know what to compare my experience right now to. Okay. But I would say I'm happy. I wake up each morning feeling challenged and excited to get into the office. And I happily on a Friday night will work till 10, 11 at night. Not because someone's telling me to, but because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it is an incredibly tumultuous roller coaster of emotions. Within one day, I can go from feeling on top of the world to feeling absolutely depressed Within a matter of hours. Within a matter of two hours, I can go from the top to the bottom. Oh, um, what what gives you the high? What gives you like the the happiness? Oh, like seeing, seeing another sign up or. Yeah, I would say the feedback we get from our users. Um, we've been getting voice notes and messages from people saying that they were crying in the car because they were so moved by a piece um, in the radcast, and I think that's really each message like that is sort of like a, a blow of wind into our little pirate okay. sail. Okay. Um, I'm glad we're a pirate ship. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 well t talk to me a little bit more about this this red cross because what what was the general idea behind it? Because I know you guys started with something different. Mm. I, th I think yeah. When I met you guys, well, Josh and I, we still don't know where we actually first met. We bumped in in that coffee shop and we we're like, I know you, yeah. you know me. <laughs> we don't know where we don't know where the, the first thing was. And, yeah. But I think Dom, I met you at that the Toad. Yes, at, at Chelsea's at, birthday. At Chelsea's birthday, yes. yes. Um, but back then, you guys were doing something different. Mm. What made you change to Radcast, and what exactly is Radcast? Cool. Uh, should we talk, talk about the journey first, or what it is? First? Yeah, you can go, go with the journey. Cool. So um, we originally started with an alarm app called Rooster. Um, it pretty much was an app that could wake you up in two ways that were far superior to an annoying beeping noise. One being that you could wake up to your friend's surprise messages. So I could wake up to MJ telling me about how many risks I have in my life. <laughs> or I could wake up to these short audio clips. So two minutes of inspiration, one minute of comedy, some bird calls, uh, a yoga meditation, all of these kinds of things, which would um, kind of wake you up in a much better mood and much cooler way than a normal alarm. And it, it can be cast as quite like a silly fun concept. But when you phrase it in the context that there are 2 billion people in the world with smartphones, conservatively 1 billion of them using them as an alarm, it's a daily routine that's a pretty high impact business or, mm -hmm. or idea that with paradigm shifting behavior. Um, but anyway, uh, it, there were a lot of obstacles with it. First and foremost, uh, mobile operating systems just didn't let people create good third party alarm apps. Mm -hmm. But it took us to America and Silicon Valley where we had a very impactful meeting with Google, uh, a, a product designer at Google. And he was really interested in this concept of short audio. He was like, this hasn't really been organized in the world. And I think you guys really have something there. And we saw the behavior with our users as well in that they were setting alarms purely for the, the sake to listen to a comedy clip or an inspirational message. So we're like, let's put this together in a much better package. Uh, and hence, Radcast was born. I'll, okay. let, I'll let Don tell you about Radcast. So Radcast is like a customizable playlist of short audio content. Essentially, we want to be better than radio stations in that you can personalize what you want to hear versus what you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. So we have segments like quiz, news, local news, global news, good news, which is quite hard to find these days, uh, tech, business, sport, comedy, positive injection. Uh, you choose which segments you want, and then we stitch those together and send you your own personalized podcast, basically. And we send it on WhatsApp, so you don't need to download another app or anything like that. Okay. Uh, we've noticed that people are quite... Uh, app-phobic. Yeah, app-phobic. They, they are, you know, because I've started using this really cool app lately called Rap Chat, okay, which gives you a beat and you just freestyle rap, and I just it's the most <laughs> amazing thing ever, okay? I just, I, I love it. And now, but... The, the audio file is saved within this app. So I keep telling people, go listen to my raps. And they're like, no, we don't want to download another app. Yeah, they it's won't, too much effort. They won't download another app mm. to, to hear me rap. And yeah. I'm just like, this is... 
yeah. people have been inundated with digital clutter and like mm-hmm. it actually I think it gives people claustrophobia or like yeah. anxiety so yeah and it takes data it takes time then it also takes space mm-hmm. on your phone and people always running out of space um, and yeah, earlier to your point, there are four million apps on the App Store. Four million. Yeah, sure. that's just the iOS App Store. And I think both Is together. Um, Can't give that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, people are a little bit over apps. Okay. So we decided to use WhatsApp just because everyone's there. It's super convenient. It's easier than thinking. We send you a radcast on a Thursday morning, and then you can just press play um, and right. listen to a bit of a bit of news, a bit of inspiration, a bit of comedy. It's basically like trying to be your audio companion that keeps you inspired, motivated, informed, mm-hmm. laughing. Have, have you guys ever seen an app called Never Think? No, but it doesn't sound like a good idea. So, well, well, <laughs> well this is this is so. When I think of Radcross, the the app I think that's similar, most similar to it, is this app called Never Think. And what it is, it's basically YouTube, but without you thinking about what video to click. So I think it's some kids in Scandinavia who've made this app. And all they do all day is they just watch YouTube videos and they categorize them as, oh, oh either it's meme, either it's millennial, either it's, oh, either it's, you know, WTF. And they put it all these ones. And then, you're jerking, X Factor yes, audition. Yes, or fashion, yeah. this, that. And then all you do is you click on a topic and then they just keep playing clips. It's playlisterization yes. of video content on curated topics. On curated topics. That's incredibly analogous to what we're doing. Yes, so. and, and I kind of think it, it's working so well, but... What is that called? Never, think. never so, think. So the whole idea is that you never have to think about what to watch. But I'm thinking it could be quite a cool thing with audio, like let's say specifically a podcast, because, so I'm, I'm trying to get into the, po- like listening to podcasts. You can see, I'm trying to start my own podcast, because I don't think I can compete on, on a visual scale. You know, these guys have got much better video editors than, mm-hmm. than my ability. And I spoke to some of my, my subscribers and they said they listen to my videos in the car. So they, they're not even looking at the visuals anyway. Mm-hmm. So I thought, let me try this, this podcast game. Um, because I think sound is easier to compete than sound and uh, visuals. But yeah, looking at that, that never think, um, I wish there would be something like that for podcasts because mm. I go into podcasts and let's say my topics that I like are religion, philosophy, finance. Some of them are really bad and mm. others of them are that you're only like getting to the meat of it like 10 minutes in. Yeah, and they're an hour long. They're, and, they're, and they're an hour long. So imagine having something where you, I don't know, imagine having people listen to all these podcasts and take snippets of like just the best part, like a five minute. Like imagine if some kid listened to this, yes. this podcast and they're like, only Josh's part, you know, and that was like the only good part of this whole thing. Mm. Let's have a little scissor cut to that and put it put it mm. in somewhere. Or if it is a really amazing, say, one hour podcast, yeah, then have tell it. you. But we don't want no one wants to listen to an hour long podcast and then forty five minutes in you realize that oh this was crap. This was crap, yeah. Because I think that's what people it's people this is my opinion, is people have got money. They've got money to spend. But they don't have time. Time is still that's what you're competing mm. now. It's and, and people I don't know, I think you almost think that people who value their time a lot are more prepared to pay because there's that thinking process that paid content is gonna give me mm-hmm. something better, it's gonna save me some time. But where where do you guys see and this is the actor in me, the businessman in me coming up saying, like, if I was an investor in Redcast, where is your guys' revenue potential streams? Because I'm I've been listening to Redcast I absolutely love it. I'm going to recommend everyone who's listening to this to to definitely sign up. There'll be some links in the description below. Oh, thanks. Um, but how do you guys make make money from it? Um, are you going to go like traditional ad way? Is it going to be a paid subscription? I don't know who wants to take this question, but yeah, how are you guys going to do it? I'll try to be super quick so Dom doesn't roll his eyes, but I have very strong opinions on on paying for for value in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, yeah, I, I, I really hope and our dream is that one day Radcast will be so high quality that um, some users will be willing to pay for our content via subscription, reasonable subscription in the same style as Spotify. And we'll kind of run the same model. So the free version will be uh, will have ads in it, but they will never, ever, ever be annoying ads like buy this insurance product uh, when it's not relevant to the target market. It'll be like this demographic of users are... St- uh, they're students, uh, so they're interested in buying second-hand textbooks, they're interested in going to Rockin' the Daisies, they're interested in drink specials. So we're exposing them to those kind of adverts uh, because it's useful to them if they want to take people up on it and it's useful to the 
um, advertisers trying to get exposure. So that would be the ad model, and then yeah, I, I would like us to have a, a subscription model for people who want the premium version, okay. which will give them premium features and, and such forth. We yeah. also are playing with another model. Another one I'd like to experiment with is a B2B play, where we go to say a company like Alan Gray and say, cool, you've got a thousand employees. This is the number of man hours they are spending in the car. There'll be thousands and thousands of cumulative hours. What are they listening to during that time? Mm -hmm. It's either their own music, so they're learning nothing, or it's the radio and they're learning nothing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so or it's my podcast and they're learning something. Yeah, so if we could curate um, <laughs> yeah. amazing content for them, like specific to financial okay. guys who need to know what's happening in the political and economic world, also add in some motivation and some life coaching and just things that they actually want so that their workforce arrives to work being informed and inspired in a better mood than listening to shitty adverts on the radio. Do you know why that is such a good idea? Because, so I live in the city and I'm very close to the highway and I just, I look outside, every time I'm like, maybe I should have a nine to five job and I look out the window at like round five and I just see the traffic and it's just, it just looks miserable and I'm like, that's why I'm not doing the nine to five. Um, you know, that's mm -hmm. one of the big perks of being an entrepreneur is you don't have to be stuck in traffic uh, like that. I don't know if you guys have traffic, but um, yeah, you've got a captive audience there. And that's why radio stations are terrible, but people are still listening to them mm. because... We, we yeah. could do a whole nother half an hour on why radio has <laughs> evolved and needs to. But, but imagine the, that was their favorite time of the day because mm -hmm. the, the quality of the content was so interesting and so inspiring, so funny. Like we had, they would love sitting in the traffic because they're just because getting they, this epic and you could mix music in and you can mix all these things that are personalized for you. Mm -hmm. But hold on, hold on, hold on. The, the little actor in me has is, is, is got a little bit of a, a, a problem here. How do you get, because in South Africa, we don't have Wi-Fi everywhere. People have to use mobile data. Mobile data is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. How would people get, like, would they download it first at home and then listen to it in the car? So it w wouldn't be like a live stream mm -hmm. that eats up their data. No, so what, you would have download to download it at home. Would have to be downloaded at home. People are already doing that, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I can say the whole traffic thing, what Dom's saying, I can imagine it was people's favorite time. We've had people tell us that they drive around the block when they get to work so that their ad cost finishes playing through. Okay. So those I kind like of stories that. that create the highs we spoke about earlier. Okay. Um, and second data will fall eventually. So like that company, so. Rain, yeah. is going to try and push the envelope there. Push yeah. the envelope there. Um, also, Michael Jordan, who's doing that? Or is it your Don? Michael your Don. Jordan. <laughs> Can I just say, like, I, I put a, this is going a little bit off topic, but I, I made this this comment uh, last year, like September, just saying, guys, what don't you like about banks? Okay, Because I was flirting with the idea of Can starting Can we say that now to your users? What don't you like about radio? Hey. Let's see what comes through in yeah, the comments. Yeah, guys, in the comments, put down what you what you don't like about radio. Because, yeah, that, that, it, that story then came up on radio that Michael Jordan was starting a bank. <laughs> And people were like, well, hold on, but Michael Jordan put a comment on Facebook about banking. <laughs> Maybe it's him. And I had people send me messages like, are you starting a bank? And I was like, I wish. I wish I was starting a bank. But yeah, So he's starting Bank Zero and he's starting Rain, which is a, like a very cheap data service. Yes. He, and that's the thing is, he's also got that, that entrepreneurial spirit, which I think mm -hmm. is so cool because too many of the times people who study finance, study accounting, study actuarial science, we get so comfortable in our boring office job and the, the end goal is to not put on too much pressure on ourselves because we're going to get our salary at the end of the month whether or not we introduce a new cool idea. But when you become an entrepreneur, you know, your money at the end of the month isn't guaranteed. You mm. have to come up with something cool and interesting. So, no, I really, I really like that Michael Jordan. Jordan guy. I did send him a tweet once and he, he didn't reply. So that, that was sad. I thought, I thought so we would have had like a bond, you know? Yeah, with but a name. I think we do need to say like, there's nothing wrong with having a normal job as well. It's hey. got a pretty bad rap in this podcast. Like the, It's terrible. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with it. In, in many cases, as long as as long as you're doing it for the right reasons. Like, yeah, as long as you're enjoying what you're doing. Then. Yeah, and then it's cool. I will mm. say, one <laughs> thing is, just, uh, I think it's people's inertia that they're in working for a corporate mm -hmm. and they're too scared to leave it mm -hmm. because they don't spend enough time picturing what is the worst case scenario. Yeah. So Tim Ferriss advocates for this that you should in detail picture what is the worst thing that could happen if you were to say leave your job and start a, your a own business or start up um, and picture, okay, cool, in five years time if it completely fails, what will my life look like? And the truth is normally you can find another 
stable job after yeah. that. So the worst case scenario isn't actually that bad. Okay. Well, I want to maybe just end off with one last big question, okay? And that is, what is your guys' vision for Radcast? Like, let's say five years from now, do you expect to have like a whole team of people working for you? Radcast is like the number one thing listened to. What what is what is the vision? Let's let's end off on a on a high. Um, Firstly, never working for you, working with you. Working with you. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I like and, and straight away I like that because yeah, I th- I hear a lot of like that's why you say oh people in the corporate jobs are getting a bad rap. So many times I talk to my friends and they're bitching and moaning about their managers because the managers has got a little bit of power Mm-mm. and that relationship dynamic, different generation, it just that's it, not cool. it really frustrates. So I like that. I like that. Not working for you, they're gonna be working with you. Okay, I like that. Um, but talk to me about what what is your your reach that you want? Do you want to be global? Do you want to just be South African? What what is the big vision? Me, I think this is tailored for you. Um, no, I genuinely think you should take it. Dom, Dom has an amazing way of putting out long term vision. That's why that's why I'm opting out of this question. Basically, I think that from the time someone wakes up to arriving at work, they should be accompanied by an awesome audio experience and we would love to be the company that delivers that combining your favorite music your favorite topics interests making you laugh making you cry making you feel moved um and so the vision is pretty big obviously it'll be really tough because there's going to be other companies who are going to try this um maybe spotify will get it right maybe another company will but hopefully we do in south africa and hopefully expand um south africa is not a huge market so we'd love to go bigger mm-hmm. but yeah we're starting starting small okay fantastic i guess my input would be this um and a lot of people have asked me like how are you feeling about radcast and i'm not sure whether dom and i will be able to execute on what he just said but i have no doubt in my mind that this concept of the next evolution of radio where it's, it has a feedback loop and it's personalized tailored to you and incredibly incredibly high quality will be done it mm-hmm. absolutely will be done by someone um so we'll we'll see in the future what happens i mean dom and i don't have any kind of uh desires to be huge and in the frontline media like we would actually quite love to be acquired by a spotify so mm-hmm. that people don't have to download another app and this yes. radcast experience is in the spotify ecosystem or itunes whatever it is but yeah we just want everything he said uh in in people's daily experience because we feel there really is a space for audio to add incredible value to people's lives, making them feel more inspired, loved, knowledgeable, all of that. Okay. Just feel more positive about their lives. So and, and podcasts are amazing, the incredible podcasts. But as you said, they're just really hard to find. So yes. if someone could just guide you through that and help you, you know, make it easier for you to find this stuff. So I do know of my viewers, only 20%, I actually think it's less than 20% now, it's like 15% are from South Africa. If my subscribers who are mainly in America and India could they still be part of Radcast and join through WhatsApp and be part of this? Yeah, we've already got users in Australia, London, America, all over. So Okay, cool. Yeah, I would encourage them to, if they have WhatsApp, then they 100% can be in and just tailor their Radcast. So probably opt out of local news and news that's specific to South Africa, like the sport news. And then from there, yeah, inspiration well, that's like is my inspiration. favorite part. I love, I love the, the Bri Bulletin. <laughs> yeah, but maybe someone from America wouldn't. <laughs> They'll be like, well, what on earth are they talking about? Yeah. yeah. Not many Americans love cricket and rugby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. I think, yeah, let's, let's end it off there. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for yeah, letting me talk to you guys and also letting me use your studio. <laughs> I mean, we've got some egg boxes. We've even got like a post of Ellen DeGeneres in here. A much more fancier mic than I have, uh, which is making me very jealous. But yeah, thank you guys so much. And um, hopefully, yeah, we'll be doing more stuff together in the future. Cool. Thanks for having us, MJ. Shot, MJ. Peace, love, and avo. Yeah. Like, subscribe, follow, jump up and down, do all of that cool stuff. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Another podcast bites the dust. No, thanks, guys.